Prime Minister Keir Starmer, he loves number two. That's the second largest religion, Islam, to me and you. Don't talk down number two, old Keir Starmer says, or you'll get prison dawa and be wearing a fez. Number two is all over Britain, as we said it would be, and they're chasing down folks just like you and me. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to This Week in Jihad, where we explore the exploits of the world's second largest religion, or as David Wood has just dubbed it, number two. Welcome, David. Yeah, I have to say there's there's something a little disturbing about what just happened, and no one no one caught it but me, Robert. So uh, let me just give people a little history lesson here, a little history lesson. This was just, when was this? This was, this was an hour ago. Oh no, a little over an hour ago, a little over an hour ago, hour, about uh, close to an hour and a half ago, I posted, I posted this. Because we've actually seen this, we've actually seen you say something online about Islam or something like this, and hey, someone needs to stand up against this, and all of a sudden you've got uh, five police officers showing up at your door. And so this is going to become an issue because politicians are calling for more of this. You see, look at all the problems in the world. They're caused by Islamophobia. That's why we need to crack down. So anyway, I'm trying to think, uh, how, we, how, we, how are we going to deal with this, right? So I wrote, I tweeted. Since governments are cracking down on criticism of Islam, we may need code language to avoid prosecution. Islam is the world's second largest religion. So I suggest calling Islam number two, as in British Prime Minister Keir Starmer is really struggling with number two, or Met Police are bending over backwards for number two. This code language will help keep you off the government's radar. Let's make it official then. Islam is number two. Can you think of any other sentences where this code language would be helpful? So anyway, I just posted that an hour and a half ago, and then we sit down and you recite a poem based on a, a tweet from an hour and a half ago. So here's what I, here's what I said is slightly disturbing. I'd always assume that you were spending like all week getting your poem ready. <laughs> I'd, always, I'd always assume that you're like, you're sitting there, you're sitting there, you're sitting around the house and okay, what's the next line? You got like a, a, a notepad and paper. You're like, no, that's not going to work. Oh, well, this is, you're going to rhymezone.com looking up which words rhyme and stuff. And I assume that was like taking you a long time. And now you just let the cat out of the bag. It seems like you just sit down right before the show and put a, put a poem together. That's right, David. Actually, the angel Gabriel appears to me, and he gives them to me. And I never know when he's going to come. One time I was so depressed when he wasn't showing up that I went to the top of a high mountain. I was going to throw myself off. But then he, 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 he appeared in the nick of time. And well, that's good. one time, you know, I, I came home and I said to everybody in the house, I'm afraid that I'm a poet or possessed. But it turned out it was just Gabriel. And so he comes to me. He gives me these things. I pass them on to the world. Yeah, and when I hear about when I hear about you thinking, "Oh, I must be possessed," or uh, <laughs> "I have to go hurl myself off a cliff," all I can think of that these are sure signs that he's a prophet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's uh... the, the, the only que the only question the only question at this point. If we wanted to seal the deal, is whether you have some giant mole on your back because that would be the case cracker right there. I have a I have a mole in the shape of a fist surrounded by warts powerful powerful well that you heard is, it here folks that ladies and gentlemen that is uh actually the sign of a prophet that in the sarah literature is given as an indication that muhammad was a prophet that uh, the 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 sarah literature actually says that the uh, jewish and christian prophecies of the coming prophet will they say that he'll have the mole on his back in the shape of a fist surrounded by warts and that Muhammad had this mm -hmm. and that many people saw it when he was a kid and said, oh, here's the coming prophet. So yeah. uh, anyway, it's all it's all in the books, folks. OK, oh. there's an awful lot of jihad this week, David. And you literally you literally just told me before we started that there was no jihad this week. Yeah, that's right. It was I was actually trying not to be Islamophobic. Uh, OK. You know, number we don't want to. Number two. Yeah, we don't want to insult number two. Keir Starmer will uh, throw us in prison, and he said, even if you're doing it online. And so I think here I am. I'm not in Britain. I'm never going to be in Britain. I'm not even allowed in Britain. 
but Keir Starmer's going to send people to come get me because I've insulted number two. Yeah, well, fortunately, they can't get you while you're over there because uh, you're still banned from the country. Yeah, yeah, they're going to send people over here. Yeah, I fully they, uh, expect. Yeah, just so everyone knows, uh, years ago, they banned Robert Spencer. He was just going to uh, to you were going to lay a wreath on the uh, at the funeral of, uh, of the grave of Lee Rigby, right? That's right. Who was murdered by jihadis. But they banned you just for being uh, an Islamophobe, which means that you'd been warning people for years what G, what about jihad, about the history of jihad and about its goals and uh, and intentions and so on. And so this was enough for them to say this man cannot be allowed in the UK. Meanwhile, you've got uh, Dawa clowns running around talking about uh, all the people they're going to publicly execute as soon as they rise to power. And the government says those are the good guys. The people warning about this are the bad guys. The people calling for the public executions of apostates, the public executions of gays. And so these are the good guys, in, according to them. So and that's jolly good show. Jolly 100% good show. accurate. What, that is exactly what happened. Because they, uh, you know, they really might send cops because they have my address. They came right here to my office, pulled up FedEx truck. The guy was impressed. He says, it's from the British government. And I signed for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how could how could you not be like? Well, I I was awaiting my orders. <laughs> special special agent 009 here. Yes, it's from Money Penny, and she's sending me on my next mission. But anyway, uh, it said you have said that Islam has doctrines of warfare against unbelievers, and therefore Shame we on. are banning you from the country. Smart, smart. So uh, it's astonishing because they got all these Muslims running around acting upon and saying openly that Islam has doctrines of warfare against unbelievers. Yeah, so that's can, okay. Can, can anyone imagine this? It's like, so if they find out that Robert Spencer, let's say, uh, says that there's a death penalty for apostasy in Islam, they'll say, that is so evil to say that, that we will not allow you in our country. And then you'll have actual Dawah guys saying, of course, we're going we're gonna to kill all the apostates. Yeah, as soon as we get the power, we're going to kill them. And they're like, our heroes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's absolutely it's absolutely amazing. It's the same thing. If we say, hey, Islam allows sex with prepubescent girls, then they'll say, oh, you're an Islamophobe. You're a bigot. But the Dawah guys can say the exact same thing. So as far as I can tell, Islamophobia is simply telling people what the Dawa guys say are telling people what the Muslim sources say and is you could just say it and yep. that's enough you're an Islamophobe if you simply repeat what the other guys are saying so that is actually the, one of the top stories this week that in Britain it's all coming out now and there are gangs of Muslims roaming around the streets uh, in service of number two saying Allahu Akbar and they have been there have been innocent people beaten on the streets and the police come up to the uh, Muslim mobs and say we are here to protect you now there's no doubt that the so-called far-right mobs that are uh, groups of people that are opposed to mass migration they have apparently done some things that are illegal burning down the uh, a hotel, I think, or setting fire there anyway. Something like that. In any case, there's there's no excuse for any kind of uh, vigilante violence of any kind. And there's no doubt about that. But the thing is that the British government, in response to this, acts as if it's a completely one-sided conflict. And that the uh, so-called far-right people are victimizing innocent Muslims on the street. When actually there's abundant video of just the opposite of uh, Muslim mobs roaming around. Hey, I've got one here, as a matter of fact. Um, there is a mob. I couldn't figure out how to get the sound to work on videos, but this is the first This Week in Jihad video to ever air while I've been the host, ladies and gentlemen. And they're screaming Allahu Akbar. And uh, there were many, many such groups around. There were other videos of people on the ground getting beaten up and so on. I don't want to show those because I don't know if they'll pull the plug on the channel, which of course they very much want to do anyway. So, but I'm going to play it safe here. Nonetheless, you can find those videos pretty, pretty easily. And the fact is 
Keir Starmer, in his quest to defend number two, he says he's going to crack down hard. None of this violence is allowed. He's going to arrest the far-right protesters. He has not acknowledged at all that there are any Muslim mobs beating up people who are non-Muslim in the slightest degree. So what's going yeah, well, on in Britain? Um, yeah, so you uh, you mentioned that they're... Uh, they're pointing, uh, they're pointing the fingers at the uh, the far right groups, um, and some. To be fair, like a lot of it is just protests and peaceful protests and stuff yes. like that. But you do have some people who are who are uh, crossing crossing lines and doing things that are illegal. Um, and so you have them. You have what the Muslims are doing, which the government and the media are just completely turning a blind eye towards. But they're 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 completely ignoring the government and the media's role in all of this. In all of this problem, in fact, I would say the government and the media are primarily the ones responsible for what's going on right here and what they're doing in response. What they're proposing to do in response is only going to make things worse. So uh, I was just talking last night to Raymond Ibrahim and we were talking about this a little bit, but I was pointing out the uh, the parallel with Anders Breivik. Remember him, Robert? Yeah, unfortunately, yes. So you had Anders Breivik, and after after he launched his terrorist attack, he, he wasn't killing Muslims. He was killing a bunch of random teenagers on, a, on an island and so on. But among all the various people he quoted when he was talking about uh, factual information about jihad, he cited you. He cited you. And this was enough for people to say, you see... He's carrying out the uh, the commands of Robert Spencer, right? Yeah. Uh, Breivik is just doing, uh, he's, he's been inspired by Robert Spencer. When I actually, as soon as it happened, I went through his manifesto where he explained exactly what his reasoning was. And very different from what we heard in the media, where people were just listening to the Islamophobes and this guy decides to go kill teenagers on an island. You think, what's the connection there? Well, you know, Robert Spencer saying, hey, we really need to get our point across. Let's go kill a bunch of kids on an island, right? No, where, where was he getting that from? Like, it sounds completely insane. In his manifesto, he, he broke it down. He said uh, he grew up in an area and he saw how Muslim immigrants were treating non-Muslims. And it really bothered him. And he says eventually this led him to actually look and see if this is in their sources. So he started reading the Quran and the Hadith, and then he found out there were problems. And he was he decided, hey, I should go into politics to deal with this. And he said in the 1990s, he realized that if you criticize Islam in any way, they're just going to call you a racist. And he said and it was that was the the media and political lockdown on any criticism of Islam was so severe that he regarded it as hopeless. It is hopeless to talk about this anymore. In other words, this man gave up on trying to communicate ideas. He said, it's too late for that and it's useless because they will not let us voice our concerns. And that's when he said, he was trying to figure out how to get a message across in a world that's, try that's silencing you. And he said, I learned from Al Qaeda. I learned from Al Qaeda how to get a message across. You do a deadly shock attack against random people and all of a sudden you'll get the world's attention so he decided that so keep in mind at no point in there are you or pamela geller or anyone else playing a role in this in this thinking in fact he says he decided all this by the end of the 1990s before any of us had ever even heard of you robert yeah. but anyway here's the here's the here's the here's the parallel it's very we have a system right now we have a system right now in the united states and uh and great britain and so on it can be a little shaky at times. It can be a little shaky at times. But we have a system where if something's going wrong, I know I can call the police still. I can still call the police. Hey, there's a guy breaking into my house. I could call the police. Um, if police cross some lines, police police officer hits me or something like this or makes something, you can actually take the police officer to court. So you can go to your courts. You can go to the government. You could go to police. And they're there to help you deal with situations, which means I don't have to go out and settle every argument I have through violence or something like that. There, there's a system in place that allows mm -hmm. peaceful resolutions to problems. Right. What happens when people give up, when, you, when you, the police make it clear that they're your enemy and they're trying to destroy you? 
and the government makes it clear that you are the enemy. They're not here to help you. They're not here to help. They're not here to, to pay any the, the slightest bit of attention of attention to your concerns. They're here to help you be subjugated. And journalists, all the media organizations, they're all working together. And you sit here and feel like, wait, every every institution of power and influence right now is trying to destroy me and my children and future generations. What do you do? Well, at least you can still go on social media to voice your complaints. You have some peaceful outlet for your frustrations. But now they're saying if you even go online and, and voice your frustrations, we'll come and lock you up. What's that mean? It means they are telling a generation of frustrated people. There is no peaceful way to deal with this. There is no pe there. You have zero peaceful options for dealing with anything that we're doing to you. That's the message that the, I'm again, I'm not sending this message. I haven't given up. I haven't given up on peaceful, uh, peaceful, uh, uh, peaceful responses to things. The government is like doing everything they can to say there is no way you have any peaceful resolution to this, which sends the message. Well, OK, we just we're, we're, we might as well get violent then, which as soon as you do, as soon as you cross a line, you go do something to a hotel or something like that, then the government does what? They say, look at this, you see? This is why we have to crack down even more, which exactly. causes people to realize even more how screwed they are and to react more violently until the government just, you see, we have to just co completely go lock all these people up. We have to do something to destroy all that. Wait, you are the guys who are, you are the guys who are causing it. You're fueling it. It's, in other words, it's Islam combined with useful idiots who are all working together to destroy everything. And who's getting blamed? The people who are who are simply re reacting to what's going on. Yep. And uh, it's and pretty you, insane. Uh, and I think it's going to get worse before it gets better, Robert. I don't have any doubt whatsoever, David. And here's our friend, the great and heroic Hatun, saying police liaison officer was telling Muslims to leave their weapons at mosques. Police liaison officer. Yes, that was an astonishing video. Uh, made it very clear exactly what you're saying. The police are not on the side of the people who are being victimized by the jihadis, but uh, on the side of the jihadis. Meanwhile, the other story, the other big story this week, David, is Bangladesh, where oh, yeah. in many ways the same kind of thing is happening. And there have been, uh, the in the first place, the um, Prime Minister uh, Sheikh Hasina was driven from power and it looks as if jihadis and uh, Sharia types are uh, taking over. They have uh, been attacking Hindus in the country wholesale. There have been over 50 attacks on Hindu temples, Hindu-owned stores, businesses, uh, Hindu uh, homes, and so on. And uh, this is uh, exactly the same thing that we're going to be seeing in Britain in a few years, is it not? Yeah, uh, I mean, you're, you're seeing the glimpses of it right now. Um, and, and, and notice what it is. Hey, we have an opportunity to go kill Hindus right now. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. So keep in mind, those people were already there. The people who wanted to go kill Hindus, they were there. They're just waiting for an opportunity. They're waiting for, a, for, an, opening, for an opening. And, oh, government change. Uh, now's our chance to go and kill some Hindus. They were already there. It's just like with ISIS. Uh, ISIS announced the call. Hey, guys, new caliphate, come down here. All of a sudden, all these people from Great Britain and France and the US and Canada, they all come flooding into the area. What's that mean? The people were already there living among you. They're walking down the street from you. And these are people who are waiting for the call to jihad. Right? Mm -hmm. So in the UK right now, you have a bunch of people who are who are simply waiting. They're waiting for the opportunity for when they go on a killing spree. And then when it happens, everyone will be shocked, even though we warned them thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Indeed. And so I can't vouch for this act, the accuracy of this, but uh, somebody in the chat says 23 Ahmadi and 5, 115 Shia Muslims have also been murdered in Bangladesh. Many Hindus have been murdered. And it's also important to remember that Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India were all part of the British colony of India, the, the Raj. And it was partitioned in 1947-48 uh, in order to create two Muslim states, 
which were originally called West Pakistan and East Pakistan, and then later East Pakistan became Bangladesh, and a secular state, not a Hindu state, but a secular state, India, which has a sizable, always had a sizable Muslim minority. The sizable Muslim minority has grown significantly since then in India. But in Pakistan and Bangladesh, the Hindu minorities that remained and did not move to India from those areas, now they have been killed, forcibly converted, driven out, almost all of them. And there is only a tiny percentage of Hindus left in both countries. And it's important to remember, this is the way of jihad. This is what happens over the years when there are Muslims and non-Muslims in one place. Ultimately, the Muslims drive out or forcibly convert or convert through the dimma ultimate, so that they, the, the dimmies convert. They, they uh, erase the non-Muslim population. This is what happened in North Africa which had a substantial Christian presence. This is what happened all over the Middle East. In Iran, it was the Zoroastrians, who now are just a tiny minority of people. I believe there are more Zoroastrians in India than there are in, in, in Iran now. And it's all the same motion everywhere. And people don't realize this is stuff that we read about in history books sanitized. Nobody ever talks about that it was jihad and Islam forcibly taking over, but it's the same thing happening today in Nigeria, in Bangladesh, in Britain, in many other places. Yeah, all over the, it's the same thing over, I mean, ISIS rides to power and they start, uh, they start uh, genociding Yazidis. Uh, you have right there in Bangladesh, hey, now we have an opportunity to go kill a bunch of Hindus. Again, they were already waiting to do that. It wasn't like some new idea. They're waiting to do that. They were prevented from doing that, but they always had the desire to do it. Um, Hamas on October 7th. Hey, we have an opportunity to go kill some Jews. Uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria. We have a bunch of, we have an opportunity to go kill a bunch of Christians. The government's not helping. Uh, are we imagining this? Are we imagining, Robert, that, that number two has a problem with non-number twos? It seems like everywhere in the world, there's a conflict between number two and somebody else. Hindus, uh, other Muslims, who Sunnis versus Shiites and vice versa, uh, Christians, Jews, wherever you are, it's something. And it's always everyone else's fault. Just keep that in mind. And not even Taylor Swift is exempt, David. Mm -hmm. I regret to have to inform you all that there were three Taylor Swift concerts in Vienna, in Austria, that have just been canceled. And they were canceled. Oh. Are yes. they going to refund my money? <laughs> I certainly think so. Taylor wouldn't keep your money for such a thing. Uh, three three concerts in Vienna because of an Islamic State jihad plot. The uh, And what's interesting, I thought, was that... These were two 19-year-olds. Oh, no, one 19-year-old, and the, the, the other one's not, well, not identified in any way. But the 19-year-old, it says here, is a citizen of Lower Austria who made an oath of allegiance to the current leader of the Islamic State at the beginning of July and says that he and his friend were both radicalized on the Internet. Now, I want to ask you this. We hear a lot about people getting radicalized on the Internet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and I just don't understand this because that that assumes several things. One is that you have uh, a different kind of Islam, apparently, on the internet from what these guys hear in their mosques in Austria, and they hear this allegedly false, hijacked, twisted Islam, and they decide, hey, let's go shoot up a Taylor Swift concert, or put a bomb there or whatever. And the question that I have for you, David, is this. If the true Islam is this peaceful, benign thing that presumably the Austrian mosques teach, and then these guys go on the internet and they get radicalized by the version of Islam that they hear there, which is actually twisted and hijacked and false, why is it that the true Islam that's peaceful and benign can't stand the challenge from the radicalized online hijacked version. 
Yeah, it is weird, isn't it? I mean, you're taught one thing all your life, and then someone comes along and starts spouting all these ideas, which totally contradict uh, everything you've ever heard and all your Muslim sources, and then you, uh, and then somehow it keeps winning. To the point, again, I mean, ISIS can just say, hey, we're the new caliphate, and all, all these people f from all around the world somehow, somehow didn't get the memo that Islam's religion of peace and tolerance, and they all somehow came to the same exact ideas about what they're supposed to do as Muslims. I've said it before. What, what's the practical difference between a religion that actually calls for violently subjugating the world and one that doesn't, but it just really, really sounds like it does? So much so that it keeps convincing its adherents that they have to violently subjugate the entire world. There's, there's, no, real, there's no practical difference, right? They both end up, you both end up with a bunch, ton of people getting killed. Um, but on this, uh, <clears throat> on this Taylor Swift thing, as I saw people complaining, oh, why don't you just get better security or something like that? They take this very seriously because of what happened at other concerts, like the Ariana Grande concert uh, and like those uh, Eagles of Death Metal concerts in, uh, in France. So they know jihadis like to attack concerts. And the reason they like to attack concerts is some uh, some guys, some jihadis will attack an area. And if they end up killing Muslims in the process, no problem. That's collateral damage. That's the thinking. Uh, and you can find support for that in the Muslim sources. But some actually want to be careful and say, let me attack a place where I'm not going to get any serious Muslims killed. And so there, what do you attack? A concert. Uh, music is haram. So all those people there, guess what? If, if someone is a Muslim, they're not a serious Muslim. And so have no problem there. They would, they would be considered heretics. And you're commanded, uh, Surah 9, verse 73, to wage jihad against, uh, against the hypocrites as well. So Muslims who just aren't following Islam as you think they should and so it's that people take this uh people take this very seriously and i have to say i mean muhammad said he'd been made victorious with terror you still got western nations you have western nations who robert let, let's just be clear here um the penalty according to the quran for making mischief in a muslim land is death dismemberment crucifixion or if it's a light case you know exile or imprisonment or something like that um According, according, not according to us, according to Islam, our Western nations, our Western nations, European nations, America, all that, are they making mischief in Muslim lands? Oh, certainly. No doubt. Okay. About it. They're making mischief in Muslim lands. The penalty is death. But it's not just it's not just the politicians and the soldiers who are making mischief. Muhammad also taught his followers that anyone who supports or aids or funds the people who are making mischief in the land, they get the same reward. Okay, so that's death. So who makes it possible? Who makes it possible? Who actually funds these Western nations making mischief in Muslim lands? Ordinary taxpayers. Mm -hmm. That's why any random person in one, in one of these societies that is making mischief, causing problems in Muslim lands, they're all fair game. Any of the people are fair game. That was and Osama so just, bin Laden's argument way back exactly. in the late 90s when yeah. he declared what jihad I, against the United States. Yeah, and what I just said, what I just said is straight from the Muslim sources. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a reason Osama bin Laden said the exact same thing. It was exactly it was exactly his reasoning. So Osama, why are you attacking the World Trade Center? Why are you attacking these random targets? What are you talking about? These are the people who pay their taxes to their governments that is doing all these things in Muslim lands. They're all fair game. Not not according to me, according to Muhammad. And yet yep. it's this it, 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 it just shocks me because this is so easy to it's like the simplest thing in the world to understand. And you can line up a thousand politicians. They will not have the combined brain cells to understand one word of anything we've just said. That's for sure. Uh, talking about politicians, David, it gets very bad. Let me get her uh, here. I know. Oh, here we go. This is Tulsi Gabbard, who was a uh, congresswoman from Hawaii and who later ran for president as a Democratic candidate in, I believe, 2016. And uh, she later broke with the Democrat Party and became a vociferous critic of the Biden administration. Now, you might wonder, what on earth does this have to do with jihad? Well, there is a program called the Quiet Skies Program. And the Quiet Skies Program is essentially a TSA surveillance program a terror watch list. It's not a no-fly list, but it's a. if you're on this, then if you get a flight, the flight is full of air, uh, air marshals. 
watching your every move and ready to pounce if you do anything that's untoward. And Tulsi Gabbard, who is a critic of the current administration in Washington and not a jihad terrorist, is, uh, has been discovered to be on this Quiet Skies program watch list. And so I just, you know, I, I can imagine there are probably all manner of jihadis who fly all over the place and have no problem. But uh, these things, these things that were these mechanisms that were put in place in order to fight jihad are now being used in all kinds of different ways by self-serving politicians. Yeah, that's one of the ongoing pro problems that, uh, I mean, it was brought up a long, long time ago. Uh, about about the courts and prosecutors and so on and the the argument was i forget which justice it was but the claim was <clears throat> that prosecutors actually have to sit down and decide which cases they're going to prosecute that means that th they're making decisions right and, and it becomes very easy to say well i like this guy so I'll, yeah I'll, i won't prosecute him for that but i don't like this guy so i will prosecute him for that and uh it went further and said that at the end of the day, if you look hard enough, you can always find something to go after someone for, right? Ah, Robert, I mean, he, uh, he was speeding all those years ago. We got to we got to get him. We got to crack down on him for that. So basically, if you wanted to enough, you could go after anyone and and arrest them. And so, you know, that that was a concern about the courts. But now you have all, you have all these government agencies and so on <clears throat> that are put together to deal with terrorist threats and so on. <clears throat> but these are made of people. And these people have agendas and so on. And so it's very easy to say, hey, uh, I'm going to use this for that, for that lady over there, and Tulsi Gabbard. I don't know about you. When I see Tulsi Gabbard, I think, uh, I don't want get to get on a plane with that because that plane's coming down. Mm -hmm. Clearly a terrorist. <clears throat> anyway, I hope she's not a Taylor Swift fan. Uh, all right. A lot of jihad in other places, David. I know Bangladesh and Britain, they're dominating the jihad news. But let's not forget that the same kinds of things are happening all over. So we got a story out of Indonesia. The National Police arrested a, another 19-year-old, a lot of teenagers this week, uh, and the uh, suspected terrorist uh, had planned to blow up places of worship and was once again an Islamic State jihadi. Now, the places of worship were not uh, actually named in the article. And they could be anything, really. They could even be mosques, could they not? No way, no way of knowing, no way of knowing. They could, could be, be mosques anything. because ISIS claims to be the caliphate. And so if you are a sympathizer of the Islamic State, you might think these mosques are disloyal, apostate, heretical structures because they don't accept the authority of the Islamic State. Mm -hmm. But in any case, that's Indonesia. Uh, in India, with all the unrest going on in Bangladesh... There was an interesting incident where a 12-year-old uh, in a madrasa, Muhammad Ayan, he got into a fight with another 12-year-old. And he said to the kid he was fighting, I swear on the Quran, I will kill you. Whereupon the other 12-year-old killed him. Hmm. <laughs> I thought, you know, David's going to love this one because... Once again, you have Allah not coming through for his boys. Mm -hmm. It's really weird. I mean, where would these 12 year olds get the idea that uh, uh, you can be killing each other? But I mean, w w what we can say is uh, it's wh where did you say this was? India. OK, India, India. <clears throat> All right. So they haven't uh, they're close, but they still haven't. Uh, they still haven't absorbed the Pakistani method, Robert, because if they had learned the Pakistani method, uh, that 12 year old who killed the other would have said, ah, no, he didn't say I, I swear by the Quran, I'll kill you. He said, I cursed the Quran and I ripped one up last oh. night and that's why I killed him. They would have gone, oh, OK, you're our hero then. Ha. Yeah, Indian authorities are not likely to, uh, at least we hope, react in the same way. You never know. Are you frozen, David? Am I frozen? You look frozen. Do you hear me? I hear you, but I see you frozen. That is weird. I'll just sign out real quick and sign right back in. 
Okay. Uh, while we're waiting for David to sign out and sign back in, we got the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where the Allied Democratic Forces, yet another Islamic State group, they uh, raided a village at night, a Christian village, murdered three people, and abducted others. The uh, Islamic State is trying to establish caliphates in West Central Africa, stretching from Nigeria to Mali, Niger, and so on. And uh, also in East Africa to Central Africa, from Somalia to the eastern part of Democratic Republic of the Congo. Then you have uh, the one in Mozambique as well. Now David is back with us, and I'm frozen. Been talking about the jihads in Africa to establish caliphates in West Africa, East Africa, as well as Southeast Africa with, in, in Mozambique. And so uh, that is something we have discussed many times before. We have, uh, let's see, stories in that regard also, of course, out of Nigeria. 16 people killed in Borno State. In another incident in Borno State, jihadis attacked a police station. In Somalia, we have a suicide attacker on a beach, murdering 37 people. And another one, a uh, guy uh, left Islam and his relatives came and they wounded him in the stomach, broke his wife's ankle and beat his children. But they must be moderates, David, are they not? Because they didn't kill him. That's the weird part. I always hear about lashing someone for leaving Islam and so on, and everyone goes, oh, am I so barbaric? And I'm thinking, it's better than what Muhammad said. Indeed. You can Indeed. always say that. Uh, uh, no matter how revolting you find the behavior of jihadis, you can, you can almost always say, well, it's better than Muhammad. Indeed. In Germany, we had a migrant, I uh, believe he was Afghan, um, no, he was from Turkey. Sorry. A family man from Turkey. Turkey. How, Nothing he, good comes from Turkey. He is uh, identified as such in Neue Westfälische, the uh, German publication where I got this story. Neue Westfälische. And uh, Neue Westfälische says, Frau will arbeiten und Kopftuch ablegen. Uh, and uh, what, this is, this, what this is saying is that uh, this family man from Turkey, he became enraged because his wife wanted to take off her hijab and go to work. And so uh, he beat, raped, and threatened to kill her. Surely this has nothing to do with Islam. Am I right, David? Number two wouldn't act this way. Yeah, that's weird. You, you would have thought... You would have thought that this guy's views would have been uh, questioned or vetted at some point. Say, I mean, you think it'd be an obvious question. Uh, you're bringing in, you're bringing in some people from other places. Seems like, seems like an obvious question to ask. Hey, if your wife or daughter decides not to wear a hijab, do you believe it's okay to beat her, kill her, any of that stuff? That would be Islamophobic. Can't ask questions. Can't like do that. it. Can't do it. <clears throat> Can't do it. That's so. Right. Who suffers? The women, because so you, it's it's always the same thing, right? Over and over and over again, it's the same thing. We don't care how many people die, or are raped, or anything else, grooming gangs and so on. We don't care how many people's lives are destroyed, as long as we don't run the risk of being called names. Yep, it's very if, strange. If, if, a, if, a, seems if, to be if a million on that basis. Yeah, if a million little girls need to be raped so that I don't get called an Islamophobe, so be it. I will gladly toss them on the altar of political correctness. That's the epitaph of Britain right there. And meanwhile, we have a story that has everything in Germany. Another one out of Germany. This one is from uh, Hamburg. A, an Afghan migrant, 24 years old. He ties a Palestinian flag around his neck and he walks into St. Maximilian Kolbe Catholic Church, walks up the center aisle toward the priest and just stands there. 
with his Palestinian flag over his shoulders. And uh, the people were a bit intimidated, and he was asked to leave, and he did. But then he started playing loud music through a speaker at the open door of the church, into the church. Can you imagine what would happen if somebody behaved this way, if a Christian... That's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, can you imagine Christian moving to a Muslim country and, hey, what are you going to do now that you're in this Muslim country? I'm going to go disrupt their services at the mosque. That's the first thing I want to do. I want to go over there and start and start disrupting everything they do at the mosque, uh, breaking up mosques, uh, smashing, smashing these crescents and so on. And and I mean, the, the thing is, if some if a Christian were to do that, it would be like international news for the next six years on problems with Islamophobia. Uh, two, the guy would catch at least a beatdown right there, and then would be hauling, uh, would be hauled off and uh, tossed in in court. And depending on where he was, would decide the uh, penalty. But it's just a ama- it doesn't cross it doesn't cross our minds. Like, hey, I'm going to another country now. I can go and completely disrupt disrupt everything they're doing. But somehow, somehow, it crosses a, the minds of a lot of Muslims, France, UK, anything. Hey, we are here to be massively disruptive. We're here to block roads. We're here to uh, disrupt their services. We're here to break their stuff, burn their stuff. That's what we're here for. And then you, you got all these politicians. Hey, ha- we, we need more of that. We need more people who believe that they're coming here just to completely disrupt and derail our entire civilization. Yes, and then Keir Starmer says, we're here to protect the Muslims. He said in June, as a matter of fact, that Islamophobia was the biggest threat facing Britain today. Sure is. Yep. <laughs> just not in the way he thinks. Yeah, well, uh, I'm just thinking, like, the only way to make that sense, the, the only way to make sense of that is is to be thinking, uh, Islam is here to take over Great Britain. And therefore, the greatest threat to what we want for Great Britain is Islamophobia. Because mm-hmm. that's the only thing that's going to... Being concerned about Islam is the only thing that's going to stop people from uh, l- letting Islam take over. That's it. Genius. All right. Out of Iraq, we got a uh, measure that is designed to amend Iraq's personal status law. And it would allow for child marriage. Mm. And it would also allow for temporary marriage. Hmm. Where do they get these ideas? Surely they must be Islamophobic, no? Yeah. Uh, and it's it's another amazing thing, Robert, where 15 years ago, we're sitting there saying, this is what Islam teaches. And you had various, uh, you know, crackdowns around the world where Muslim nations were forced to modify their positions in order to continue having uh, various trade agreements and so on with other countries. And so they're forced, hey, you have to do this. Uh, but we warn people, hey, as uh, you know, as time goes on, the weaker they think you are, the weaker they think you are, and the less likely they think you are to act on any of these uh, restrict restrictions from the past, they're going to bring this stuff back. They're going to keep bringing this stuff back. Nope, you're Islamophobes. Islam doesn't teach these. Only a only a, an Islamophobic bigot would say that Islam uh, has these things about temporary marriage and marrying little girls and so on. You guys are you're racist and bigots. And then all of a sudden you got the Dawah guys shouting it from the rooftops. Of course we do these things. And now you have governments saying, you know what? We need to we need to go back to that uh, banging nine-year-old girls thing because uh, we were only forced into changing that because of Western nations. And now Western yeah. nations are weak and pathetic and they wouldn't dare criticize us because we've trained them all to be horrified at the thought of being called Islamophobes. So guess what? We can start banging nine-year-old girls again. What are they going to do? Whatever they, if they criticize it, we say, guys, stop being so Islamophobic. This is what our prophet did. Are you criticizing our prophet? Oh no, we weren't criticizing your prophet. Yeah, bang all the nine-year-old girls you want. In fact, bang our nine-year-old girls. Whatever you want to do, just don't call us names. Bunch of cowards. That's it. All right. We have, let's see. Um, goodness. Oh, there it is. This is Inas Hania. And Inas Hania is Ismail Hania's daughter-in-law. And this is an interview she did not long after he was killed. 
you can see how happy she is. And she's talking about his death there. She says, this is a wedding. She's not mourning. She says uh, that he was born. He says the assassination of Hania, she's referring to that. She says, it's a momentous event. It is not trivial of our nation to lose a godly man of such global magnitude like Ismail Hania. And she says he was born a Mujahid and died a martyr, a champion, and a hero. And so uh, this is why, of course, she's happy. They say that they love death, and so she's happy. And so it seems odd that they would be upset with Israel at all. Because yeah, I mean, it seems it seems like a per it seems like a perfect relationship. You guys love death and martyrdom, according to what you say, and Israel loves taking out terrorists who killed their people. You're frozen win, again. Win, 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 win. It's win, win situation. Yeah, don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. You want to come back again? Yeah, I will. I will. I'll do okay. it again. We okay, go. we'll see if it works this time. There's plenty of jihad here. I'll. Keep going, ladies and gentlemen. We have a story out of Canada. Uh, Ahmed Fuad Mustafa El Didi and his son, Mustafa El Didi. We're in the advanced stages. Here he is again. That was fast. Welcome back, David. I was talking about a story from Canada. Eh? Oh, and, uh, yeah, it actually was very quick. So all I got was to say the names of these gentlemen, Ahmed Fuad Mustafa El Didi, and his son. Like a good Mormon. Good Mustafa Mormon. Mustafa <laughs> Yeah, didn't he run for president in 2012? Those dudes, those dudes showed up at my door, and it was like Elder Mustafa and so on. They're like, yeah. uh, hey, we want to tell you about uh, Prophet. Oh, yeah. And his son, Mustafa El Didi, they were in the advanced stages of planning mm -hmm. a serious violent attack in Toronto and had filmed a video of themselves holding weapons in front of an ISIS flag. Now it's interesting to note Canada is another place where the government's very concerned about Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. They have an Islamophobia czar in, uh, in Canada who makes sure that nobody dislikes any Muslims. Eh? Quit uh, calling them. Quit calling them czars. Call them jihadis. <laughs> say, this is this is our Islamophobia jihadi who wages war on anyone who uh, is an Islamophobe. What a great idea! What a great idea! Yeah. Call up Justin Trudeau. Justin, I know you're watching. Make uh, what is her name? Um, Amina El Gawabi, I believe her name is. Amira or Amina. Anyway, uh, she's a very grim, hijab-wearing individual. Doesn't seem like she appreciates a good joke. And nope. uh, she uh, is wouldn't even is, wouldn't even like your poems. I bet not. I bet I bet she would not recognize me as a prophet either. It's 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 a terrible thing. By the way, but, isn't it uh, isn't it crazy? I mean, we're we're talking about like governments that specifically like bend over backwards to appease Islam and Muslim, and will do anything. Will throw their uh, will throw their own citizens under the bus in a heartbeat will crack down on their own people in a heartbeat if it means showing Muslims uh, that they can do absolutely anything they want mm -hmm. and they will never be questioned. And in these same places, you'll have people, hey, we got to go kill a bunch of people in this nation. Like, like what, what does it take? Guys, the, the appeasement thing doesn't work. The, the showering them with praise doesn't work. The going after Islamophobes doesn't work. When they see you going after Islamophobes, in their minds, it's, oh, these guys are not going to stand up to us. They will not stand up to us. They're weak. This is a time to terrorize them. And That's no matter right. how many times it happens, never get the point. Never, ever get the point. Never. And so we got all kinds of appeasement stories this week. Here's another one. This is Portugal. And in Portugal, they have the uh, São uh, Lázaro, Lázaro, São Lázaro statue from 1386. I hope that all you Portuguese speakers appreciate the São, and I believe I said that correctly. That's S A with a tilde over it. O Saint Lazarus, São Lázaro. 
And anyway, this statue dates from 1386, and they toppled, it's a national monument in Portugal, and as you see there, they toppled the cross, the uh, big stone cross, and broke it. Now, uh, the deed was attributed to unidentified migrants. Of course, anybody could have done this, but why might it be possible or, or perhaps even likely that these were Muslim migrants, David? I mean, isn't that a goal in Islam? I mean, isn't that what uh, what Jesus is going to return to to do? He's going to return to break the cross, and so that's a that's a goal. That's a thing. This it's breaking the cross is something that Allah wants. That's it. And so there it is: broken cross, one broken cross in Portugal. That's a victory for Islam, and Islamophobia was once again stymied. In France, David, we had a story, and the, it involves Roma people. And uh, I have to explain that those people are the people who used to be known as gypsies. And uh, not uh, trying to offend anybody by calling them gypsies, but I've seen people call Roma, uh, see Roma, and they think, oh, they're Romanians or uh, Romans from Italy or something. But in any case, what we're talking about are the people who were formerly known as gypsies. Apparently that's an offensive word now, so I apologize to all the gypsies who are watching tonight. But I don't know, case, Tyson, Fury, Tyson Fury calls himself the Gypsy King, so I think there are some who are still pretty cool with it. Okay, well that's fine then. Uh, in any case, we had- I think, I think it's a thing where if you're not using it in a derogatory term, like, ah, those filthy gypsies or something like that, then, then I think you're okay. Okay, so we had uh, this plot in France to kill two Roma, or gypsies, and uh, this guy said, one of, the, one of the jihadi plotters, he said that uh, he wanted to kill gypsies, and that's in quotes, so he, that's the word he used, by, and he justified it by quoting the Quran. Now, David, uh, the Quran surely doesn't have anything in it justifying killing. That, that, that would be Islamophobic. Well, not gypsies in particular, so there's that. <laughs> it, doesn't, it, doesn't say, it doesn't say kill the gypsies. It, says, it, just, says, it, just, says, it just says kill those who do not believe. <laughs> so, so. so if you're a gypsy who does not believe... You might be in trouble. Also in France, we had a uh, migrant from Tunisia. And he is, uh, he got in a little bit of hot water because he shouted, in, he's in prison. He's in prison for various other offenses, but he uh, got angry with a warden and said, this is why we are committed to the Islamic State. What is happening? You asked for it. We're going to blow everything up. And the warden said, I perceived his words as a threat. <laughs> Uh-oh, he's gone, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but in any case, I think that's pretty clear. Those, those words were a threat. And so uh, Francis got big trouble, just like the other countries in Western Europe because this is just a threat they are not interested in dealing with. And as long as that remains true, then we're just going to have more incidents of this kind. I don't know how much you heard of that, David, but anyway. No, guys, I'm sure it's good stuff. I think I figured out the problem. Anytime I was getting some sort of notification from Skype, which I just put on there, uh, it was freezing. So hopefully that solved the problem, shutting that down. Okay, very good. And uh, we have a story out of Egypt. This story actually dates back several months. This is Irene Ibrahim Shehada, who is a uh, Christian woman in Egypt who was abducted in January. And the American Center for Law and Justice uh, has just this week renewed a call uh, to the UN, as a matter of fact, to try to prevail upon them to get the uh, to pressure the Egyptian government to get her freed. But what happened was Irene Ibrahim Shehada, a 21-year-old Christian woman, 
was a second year medical student and was in the middle of midterm exams and disappeared during the midterm exams. Uh, a few weeks later, she stole the phone of the Muslim who had abducted her and called her brother and tearfully pleaded for him to come and save her. Uh, but then the captor discovered uh, her on the phone, tore the phone out of her hands, said to her brother, okay, you heard her voice and know she's okay, right? Now go to hell. And so a month after that, her ID, her, her, uh, her, her the electronic record of her national ID in Egypt was changed so to identify her as a Muslim. This is uh, something that's a common tactic in Egypt that the Muslim Brotherhood uses to force families to give up searching for a Christian woman because then they say, well, see, she voluntarily converted to Islam. But it seems from her phone call that that's uh, very unlikely. This is something that's quite common in Egypt as well as in uh, Pakistan and other countries. You have Christian women kidnapped and forcibly married to Muslim men and forcibly converted to Islam. What's the uh, endeavor here, David? What's going on? You are taking over the reproductive capabilities of the enemies over time. And uh, if you do this, if you do this long enough, you just the the population that you're dealing with uh, dwindles. Right. So you take the you take their daughters for yourselves and start producing children, Muslim children from their daughters and so on. And this is a yeah, this has been a. This has been a issue going way back for, for people who, who uh, have wondered why Coptic Christians get tattoos even when they're even when they're like babies, they'll start putting tattoos on them. It was because kidnapping was so uh, prevalent back in the day that, hey, if someone wants your little daughter, they'll just go up and snatch your little daughter. And then who do you complain to? The Muslim police? Who are they going to side with? Who are they going to side with? Yeah. And we see it's you're, you're right. It's the same thing we see even today in Egypt and Pakistan and so on. Uh, someone kidnaps your daughter, forces her to convert, uh, marries her, um, starts raping her. And you go and complain to police. And very frequently, those police will turn a blind eye towards that because they're fine with it. But also, even if they're not personally fine with it, they know if they go in and take that take that girl back from that Muslim family, there's going to be a Muslim mob outside the police station burning it to the ground. Oh yeah, and and so it's a uh, as you pointed out, the things that we see and going on in Pakistan and Bangladesh and so on, they're coming to Western nations because Western nations are doing everything they can to announce, we will not stand in your way. Form a mob, we will not stand in your way. Just like just like police in uh, you know Pakistan and so on won't stand in your way. That's right. And uh, yes, it's as we have been saying, as we said at the beginning, it's well in 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 motion already in Britain. Uh, it's never irreversible. It ain't over till it's over. But you have the government in full retreat. As I noted before, Starmer said that Islamophobia is the biggest problem that the UK faces and the uh, zero tolerance approach he is applying to so-called Islamophobia, but not to the Muslim violence against non-Muslims. Meanwhile, the Royal Navy in the UK, Royal Navy personnel, David, had been advised not to wear their uniforms in public. And RAF, the uh, Royal Air Force, uh, has a squadron, 14 squadron, that has been called the Crusaders. But it is dropping the Crusader nickname now because it is offensive to Muslims. Now, when you have a culture that uh, looks at the world via strength and weakness, how are they going to view these kinds of things? It, it's, it's crazy because, um, you know, we're looking at like the avalanche of apostasy and looking at Islam crumbling from within. Uh, as far as the, and, and, and we brought this up like, one of the things that bothers Muslims most when they, and causes them to start doubting Islam is the weakness of the ummah. They're looking around saying, um, we should be in charge here. And we, we, would like to, we would like to keep the trend going of realizing, hey, Allah is not on our side. 
You want to keep that going when you go and, hey, we're going to go kill all the Jews. And so you want them to lose to the point where they keep losing and losing and losing. And they start thinking, OK, this isn't working. Allah's not on our side here. You want that. But what our governments are doing is saying, hey, four mobs, take over. We want to help you take over. And that's giving them, oh, maybe this is Allah opening a door for us. Mm. Maybe this is Allah's plan. We've been wondering because it looked really messy. We lost our caliphate. Then we brought a caliphate back and we lost that. And we don't know what's going on here. We can't deal with the Jews. We got two billion people and we can't deal with a few million Jews. We feel so weak and powerless. We're starting to doubt our religion. And <gasps> maybe this Allah is, since Allah is the grace, greatest of schemers, the greatest of plotters, the greatest of planners, the greatest of deceivers, since he's the greatest at all these things, maybe this is how he's giving us the victory. And so it's it's very encouraging from a Muslim perspective to see maybe, maybe we are going to take over. Mm -hmm. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. It is the weakness of the West that is enabling the jihad at this point, at least in Western Europe, Britain, and the United States and Canada. And so it's very important to stand strong. Don't let yourself be intimidated or bullied. And we will be back probably next week with more jihad. In the meantime, pray, hope, and don't worry. And keep resisting, number two.